Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this sixth Sunday of Easter. Those of you who are here in person and those of you worshiping from home as well. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The joy and peace of God be with you all. Oh 
together the prayer of the day. Bountiful God, you gather your people into your realm, and you promise us food from your tree of life. Nourish us with your word, that empowered by your spirit, we may love one another and the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our rescuer and ruler, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hello, Hope and Lucy. We are glad that you are watching and worshiping from home. I am Bob, Bobcat. Hello, everybody. And all the other people worshiping from home, too. Good morning. Oh, hi, BJ. Hello, Bobcat. I'm glad you're here. We're going to actually talk today. We're going to hear a story um, where Jesus is going to tell us a story about um, an advocate. Advocate? I've never heard of an advocate. But everybody. Everybody is promised by Jesus that even when he is gone from walking on the earth, that they will not be alone because the advocate will be with them. Oh, that's good. Everybody should have a cat. I think that's good. Other people agree here too. Yay for cats. Who is this advocate? Well, um, what color is the advocate? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, the advocate, we don't know what color she is. Why not? Because she's invisible. Invisible? Jesus is giving us an invisible cat? That's intriguing. Is the kitty litter also invisible? Uh, there's actually no kitty litter involved. <laughs> Even though the, the name is Advocate, it's, it's not actually a cat. I thought you promised a cat. No, no, Jesus. Okay, let me explain. Please explain. You're confusing me. Um, Jesus promises that even when he isn't walking with us anymore, that he will send the Holy Spirit. I thought you said advocate. Well, advocate is sort of what the Holy Spirit does. You're confusing me. Okay, so we don't, we don't see the Holy Spirit so much as we feel the things that the Holy Spirit is doing. Like what? Like comforting us, okay, and, and reminding us. That, that Jesus loves us and God loves us exactly as we are, that's very good, and, and walking with us and guiding us. Those are sorts of things that we say an advocate does. Oh, so it's different than a cat. It's a spirit, exactly, called advocate. Exactly. Sorry for the confusion, girls. Um, so that, but that's still a good promise, and, and it means that even though we sometimes feel like we're alone, we know that we're not because Jesus has sent to us the Holy Spirit to guide us and to comfort us and to remind us that God always loves us just as we are. And that is very good news. That is very good news. And even better news, no kitty litter. Amen. Yea, advocate. Amen. Bye-bye. Today's first reading is from Acts, the 16th chapter. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, 
we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Alleluia! Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Alleluia! The Holy Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord! Jesus answered Judas, not Iscariot, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, when Tom and Karen and I were at the Synod Assembly, it was a real treat, just, not just because it's, it's inspiring, and Tom and Karen were sharing with you last week some of the uh, amazing things that they got to experience and, and to realize how much bigger the, the church that we're part of is than, than just uh, what we are here, how we're connected across many states, across the nation, across the world, and doing, we're part of lots of really amazing things that happen. And also, it's really wonderful to get to connect with colleagues and other folks that you don't get to see very often because we are so spread out. And one of the special ones was, um, I got to see Pastor McNamara and his wife Joan, who were there. Um, now, Pastor McNamara tried to retire a few years ago, but it didn't work out. He failed retirement. And uh, he's, he's now serving an Episcopal church in Wyoming as a Lutheran pastor, because we have full communion uh, agreement there. So it was great to get to see him there. And then also there are different booths and tables set up of folks uh, sharing information about the different kinds of ministries that are involved. And his wife, Joan, had a booth set up because she has a ministry that she's been doing for years and years, and guess what, Lucy and Hope? It's a puppet ministry. <laughs> she does puppets, and she has puppet scripts and puppets and puppet ministry things that she has on hand, and it was wonderful to get to see them, not just because he's a colleague here in the Rocky Mountain Synod, but because he and his wife Joan were, I believe, the first house guests, dinner guests, that my wife Kristen and I ever had in our lives. Uh, we were a brand new couple, and we had been 
worshiping at the campus ministry in Champaign, Illinois, at the University of Illinois, and we become involved there at the, the campus ministry, and Joan had pulled us into puppet ministry, uh, kind of where we got we got started, so it was really wonderful to get to see them at Synod Assembly and, and to uh, reminisce about some of the times when we first got started out. It was, it was, a, uh, it was a tiny apartment. It was uh, almost as big as the choir loft here. Um, in fact, it, it was so, uh, our, our bedroom was so small. How small was it? It was so small that the, literally the only thing that fit in that bedroom was the bed. So um, Krista, if I remember correctly, Kristen's dresser was in the kitchen and my dresser was in the living room and because she was finishing up the cooking she got to shower and dress first and it took a little longer than expected so i was still getting out of the shower as pastor bob and joan arrived so i had to knock on the door of the bedroom and say kristen could you go in the living room and bring me my clothes please <laughs> a little embarrassing for your first ever you know dinner guests but but they were lovely of course they were lovely and it was just a really great relationship and obviously has, has continued for many years as well. A reminder of, of how, I don't know if dangerous is the right word, but impactful perhaps hospitality can be because you, you welcome people not only into your home, but especially welcome them into your heart. And if you're not careful, they change you. And, and you start welcoming people like Pastor Bob and Joan into your home and into your heart. And if you're not careful, a few years later, you might find yourself a pastor because of that influence of who they are and how they are in the world. And we hear, we hear a wonderful story today that Annie read to us about hospitality, about welcoming. Um, Paul himself has demonstrated an openness and a welcoming to the Holy Spirit in his life and, and really uh, pays attention to the Holy Spirit because Paul has some ideas. I think I'd like to go over here because I think I'd like to, to preach to the people here about the good news about Jesus and he listens to the Holy Spirit and she says, no, Paul, not right now. I don't want you to go to that place. And he's, well, Fine, we won't go there then. And he's trying to figure out what, what shall I do? And he has this vision. I think, I'm not sure, but I think every single week in Easter this year, somebody has had a vision. It's, it's kind of amazing that our, our faith and the spread of our faith is based on visions of people. So Ken here has a vision. We're like, okay, Ken, really? That's what we're supposed to Okay, well, Ken, Ken had a vision, and we trust Ken, so we're going to follow Ken's vision. I mean, that's, that's a... a important basis of our faith is listening to one another, having hospitality and welcoming to the Holy Spirit speaking through somebody other than us sometimes. That's a sense of welcome and hospitality to, to the presence of the Spirit within the community and the community honoring that. And so Paul and his friends, uh, they're trying to figure out where to go. And this vision that he has is of a man over in Greece. And, and the man in Greece and Paul's vision says, come to us, Paul. And so uh, Paul and his friends, they leave where they are, which is Western Turkey, modern day Turkey, and they go across the sea to uh, modern day Greece to a town called Philippi or Philippi. And, and they arrive there, uh, but there's, there's no man there from the vision ready to welcome them. So they're looking around, where should we go? We'll go up by the river. We heard there's a place that, that people go to pray by the river, and they're looking around um, trying to find some people to preach to, but they, they can't find any people to preach to. It's just a bunch of women. Oh, the women, that's who we should go and preach to. That's who we should bring the good news of Jesus Christ to. And they do that. And among them is this woman named Lydia. Now, here's what's interesting. Lydia is in Philippi. She's in Greece. We don't know how long she's been there. But she's from Thyatira, which is in western Turkey. So she's from where Paul just was at. And now she's at the place that Paul was called to and she is a fascinating woman for so many reasons. One is that it is her openness, her welcome, her hospitality that is the seed for the church finding root in Europe. It leaves the Middle East, doesn't leave the Middle East, it expands from the Middle East 
into Europe because of, in large part, Lydia. That she is a person who is open to the Holy Spirit. God opens her heart to hear and welcome the Word of God. And she opens her heart and her home to Paul and the disciples, which is kind of amazing, especially in, in that culture, because that wouldn't be the sort of thing that a woman would do, would be to welcome uh, a stranger like this into her home. And she's a fascinating person for a couple of reasons, because there's, there's this descriptor of her. In, in, in Greek, it's, it's a... It's a combination word, and most people describe her, as we heard today, as a seller of purple cloths. And purple cloth is a big deal at this time and in this place because it's very rare and very expensive. Um, they, they make the dye from these, these little mollusks, these little sea snails, and it, I want to see if I remember correctly, it takes something like 7,000 of these little mollusks to create one gram of purple ink. So it's very rare, very expensive. Mostly only kings and, and rich people uh, are able to afford it. So she appears to be a pretty amazing person if she is able to, to travel around from Turkey to Greece and, and sell this, this purple cloth. Uh, she's, she's kind of distinctive, a person of means. Not just a person of means, a woman of means. And here she is willing to open her home to the, the disciples the apostles, and to open her heart to this new word of God in Jesus Christ. And from her hospitality, the whole world changes. From this one word, one woman's hospitality, the whole world changes. As I say, that, that Greek word that describes who she is, what she is, rather, occurs only one time in, in the whole New Testament here. And most scholars, if you look up most translations, it'll describe her as a seller of purple cloth. But there's a minority opinion among scholars that says that may not be the right description of who, of who she is. Rather than being a seller or a merchant of purple cloth, she may be not so much on the sales end of the process, but more on the production end of the process. And that's a very different status. If I'm somebody who's selling very expensive purple cloth, that puts me in one social status. If I'm somebody who just sticks her hand inside this purple gook, stinky, smelly, fishy stuff, and, and I'm, uh, I'm creating it so that other people can have it, that's a very different social status. And either way, whether she is this woman of means or whether she is this poor person who's just getting by, maybe even a migrant worker type status, nevertheless, in her, God chooses to open up the presence of God's word and the welcome of God's church that changes the world. And we get invited into that kind of openness and that kind of welcome. Among the, the many other booths besides the puppet booth uh, at the Synod Assembly was Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, the, a long-standing ministry of our larger church that all across the world in many different places and ways finds people who have been inspired, like Lydia, to open hearts and homes to welcome those who are in need. And it makes a difference. It changes the world. It doesn't just change the one who, who is desperate and, and frightened and fleeing. It makes a difference in their life because now they have somewhere safe. They have a, not just a somewhere safe, but a someone safe that welcomes them and makes a space for them. It also changes the one who's doing the welcoming. You become changed by that. Like, like Kristen and I welcoming Pastor Bob and Joan, we are changed by that. And so do those who welcome uh, folks who are in need of safe space are changed. And like Lydia, who knows the reach of that welcome, the power of that hospitality. Some amazing, fascinating, inspiring stories of welcome from all around the world going on these days. The Prime Minister of Finland, Juha Sipila, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, uh, announced that he will personally uh, offer his own home north of Helsinki to house refugees. Um, in Australia, 
there was a, a pastor and activist named Jared McKenna and his wife, Teresa, who wanted to open up a home to welcome refugees where they could pay very minimal rent and they could get a start, they could, they could you know, find a place where they could get a record of, of having paid rent. So then it makes them easy, it makes it easier for them to go to the next place and say, look, I have a history of being able to pay my rent and, and they can, they can uh, begin to set down roots. And uh, when the bank rejected the pastor and his wife's loan application, they launched a social media campaign inviting the rest of the, the wider public to be the bank and lend them the rest of the money. Uh, within a couple of weeks, the community had pledged $600,000 in loans and donations so that they could open this space for, for refugees. I don't know if you heard, but, but Pope Francis uh, pledged that the Vatican itself would welcome refugees and encouraged others to do the same. Um, in Iceland, uh, there were some folks who were frustrated when they learned that the, their government was going to welcome, uh, taking just 50 refugees. And so an author by the name of a uh, popular Icelandic author by the name of Brindis Björg, Björgvinsdottir uh, encouraged her fellow citizens to stand up and speak out in favor of those in need of refuge. And within 24 hours, 10,000 Icelanders took to Facebook to offer up their own homes to refugees. 10,000 Icelanders in a country that has a population of only 300,000. 10,000 out of 300,000 said, we, we will make our homes a space of welcome. And one more, uh, when thousands of refugees began walking cross country from Hungary to Austria, a bunch of Austrian volunteers decided, well, we're not just gonna sit here and wait for them to arrive. And so a convoy of around 140 vehicles set out from Vienna to pick them up and bring them to their new home and provide them with aid power, the power of welcome and hospitality. It made all the difference for Paul and for Lydia and for Philippi and for Europe and for the world. And we too are invited into the power of welcome and hospitality. Amen.
risen one, as you share breakfast with the disciples on the shore, meet us now in this meal. Nourish us to follow you, using our gifts to feed the hungry and tend the weary. And all for your love's sake. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless us now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace in the power of hospitality and serve the Lord. By the presence and power of God, we will.